Hello everyone, uh, so my name is Marta and I'm a Spanish student in University of Seville and this is a talk that I prepared for, for a cultural week that we celebrate in our university, uh, mainly because of the Pi Day, so there's a cultural week that uh, well, uh, we students can give talks and uh, prepare uh, activities and things like that. Um, I prepare um, a talk about elliptic curves and Fermat's theory, and I had a lot of fun doing this. So I thought that I could uh, do this also in English and share it with more people because, uh, well, because elliptic curves are my favorite thing in the world, and I love talking about this. And I think that maybe uh, I can uh, give you a very interesting uh, way of seeing them. Or if you don't know what they are, um, I think that um, that I can give you reasons for caring about this. And this is something that you may find cool, I think. So this is what I want to talk to you about today. It's, um, I call this talk um, a drip uh, through elliptic curves and Fermat's theorem. And so if you don't know what an elliptic curve is, maybe you did a quick search uh, on Google or something, and you uh, saw these uh, famous um, uh, drawings. So this is what we usually have in mind when we talk about elliptic curves. Um, but uh, like I said before, uh, I want to um, talk about other different ways of thinking about elliptic curves that I think that you might find very interesting. Uh, but before um, explaining what an elliptic curve is, uh, I want to give you motivation for caring about them. And even though the story starts uh, lo lots of years ago, uh, I'm going to stop to start uh, at and the in the year uh, 109, uh, sorry 1900 uh, with Hilbert's tenth problem. So uh, this mathematician Hilbert Hilbert uh, gave in this year a list of of 23 problems that he considered that they were uh, like very important, that they, it was the priority to solve them. And among them, so it, uh, his, he gave the, the, the Riemann hypothesis, the uh, Goldberg conjecture, and lots more of different areas as well. And one of them, the 10th problem was this one that I wrote here. So this uh, the 10th problem says that uh, you consider a polynomial equation in n variables uh, with integer coefficients. So this is what we call uh, the Ophantine equations. They are uh, only um, polynomial equations with integer coefficients uh, of any degree. Uh, that would be a general Diophantine equation. And we are usually uh, interested in knowing the integer solutions or sometimes also rational solutions uh, is what is interesting about uh, the Ophantine equations. And the problem says, uh, can we find an algorithm that determines if any given a uh, Diophantine equation like this has integer solutions? So it turns out that in 1970, uh, these mathematicians, Davis, Matiashevich, Pugnan, and Robinson, prove that such an algorithm cannot exist. So this kind of says that our knowledge, knowledge about uh, the Ophantine equations is kind of limited. We can't have an algorithm for knowing if any given uh, the Ophantine equation has integer solutions. So, uh, so this is um, the, the a modern uh, problem, but uh, people actually uh, start, to start uh, caring about the Ophantine equations lots of years ago. This uh, starts, well, our first evidence of, of this is um, this uh, clay table 
from the Babylonian era, oh, so this would be the year uh, 108, uh, sorry, 1800 uh, BC. So this is uh, a lot of years ago. And um, in this, uh, this is from uh, the Babylonia, Babylonian era. And in this clay table, uh, there are uh, some solutions of Pythagorean triples. So Pythagorean triples uh, would be um, equations of this form. So this is actually another kind of Biofantine equation. Uh, it's what the, the one that satisfies uh, Pythagoras theorem. So for example, one of the solutions uh, that is here, uh, even though I can't and you can't understand them, uh, one of the solutions is this one, is uh, these three numbers. So this, for example, this one is um, too hard, a solution that is too hard to compute by brute force. So we have an evidence that in around these years, people already was thinking about methods for um, trying to find solutions of, of this kind of Biofantine equations. So this is really a fundamental problem uh, in mathematics, uh, polynomial equations and knowing their solutions, right? So one thing we can do is, okay, well, we, maybe our uh, knowledge of Biofantine equations is limited, but what do we know so far? So, okay, because I want to talk about uh, elliptic curves, I'm going to restrict now to um, the Diophantine equations in two variables, because these are the ones that define um, curves, uh, okay? Because uh, you know that um, polynomial equations defines some kind of geometric objects. So in this case, in this case of uh, two variables, they define curves. So uh, now I'm going to talk about this case. So restricting to these uh, two, two variables that I denote X and Y, obviously, uh, now we can say, okay, let's start for the easiest part that is degree one. What do we know about uh, degree one curves? Um, so, we we have a theorem for 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 solving the for knowing the solutions of this. We know that this equation, uh, obviously a, b, and c are integers, okay, because we are talking about the Fantin equations. So this e equation has integer solutions if and only if the greatest common divisor of a and b divides the integer c. So if that happens. Uh, this equation has infinite solutions because we can parameterize them. And if, if this condition is not, uh, doesn't hold, then we don't have any solutions. So let me give you a, a silly example if you want. This equation uh, has infinite solutions because the GCD of two and one divides one. Obviously one divides one. So we know that this equation has infinite solutions because we can parameterize, uh, we, we only need to, to solve uh, for, for x. So, so the plugging uh, different values in lambda, uh, we get uh, all the solutions that we want. So we know about this case, we know very well how these case behave. These are the kind of geometric objects that live here. Uh, they are only lines like this, or well, like this, uh, depends on the equation, right? So this is maybe not so interesting. We know how, how it works. So now we can go uh, a bit up uh, to degree two. So this could be a general um, a polynomial equation of degree two. And um, again, we ask ourselves, uh, what do we know about uh, these this kind of equations? So there's a very um, important theorem uh, about quadratic forms uh, that is called the Hasiminkowski theorem in this case of, of degree two, which says that um, this uh, equation has solutions, has rational solutions if and only if it has solutions over the reals and over every periodic field. 
So if you don't know what phyadic fields, um, you can think of them as another way of uh, getting complete fields from Q. So it turns out that there's only two ways, non-equivalent ways of completing Q. One with, with one absolute value, you obtain R, the reals, and with other absolute value that is called the periodic value, uh, you would obtain uh, these fields that are local fields. So the, this, this seems to be difficult because uh, there are infinitely many uh, fields, uh, periodic fields, uh, one for each prime. But turns out that in practice, uh, when you have to check this, you only need to check for a finite number of them that depends on the coefficients of the equation. So actually, this is very a very powerful and helpful, helpful theorem. Um, so when this uh, thing happened that we can check locally, this means over these fields and over R, and, um, and getting solutions globally, this means over a Q, uh, we say that the local to global principle holds. And we would like uh, that this happens all the time. Uh, but sadly, sadly, this uh, doesn't happen always. At least in the degree two, it holds. It, it, it works here, so we know how this behaves, even though it's a bit more difficult, but we know. So geometrically speaking, um, we have in this case uh, genus zero curves. And genus zero curves have either infinite rational points or none at all. And um, if you don't know what the genus of a curve is, um, so you, uh, I don't know if this can sound a bit weird at first, but it, it's just like this, okay? You will have to believe me. Um, when you, um, you can see curves over algebraically closed fields, so you can think of the complex numbers. If you uh, consider uh, curves, curves over the complex numbers, they actually look like surfaces, like Riemann surfaces. So these uh, Riemann surfaces may, may have a number of holes, right? So the number of holes is what we call the genus. I know it's difficult maybe to think um, this way at first, but this is what I want you to have in mind, at least for now. So uh, what we have here is that in degree two, um, all these curves have genus of zero. And for example, uh, the, the kind of the geometric objects that live here are ellipse, parabola, hyperbola, conics, uh, the famous conics uh, are the ones that live here. So in the end, we also know pretty well how this case behaves. Now what happens if we go to degree three? Oops, degree three. Degree three. Oof, this is already looking uglier, right? It's a very, now it's, a very uh, longer equation, um, it, it goes uh, uh, worse uh, when we go up. Uh, again, we ask ourselves, what do we know about these uh, equations? And this is when, when the problem begins. We have countered some parts of what? Of the local to global principle, because uh, like I said, uh, this is kind of a philosophy. Uh, when we when we see locally, when we find uh, solutions locally and deduce that we have a solution globally, this is like I said, a philosophy that we want uh, that to uh, we want to this to happens always. But already in degree three, this um, breaks. Well, um, this is not even a degree, a degree three curve, but this is historically the first uh, evidence of the local to global principle failing. Um, so this is what happens here, that this equation has uh, solutions over R and over every periodic field, and uh, it doesn't have a solution over the, over the rationals. And this is also a very famous example uh, by Selmer that this, this is degree three. 
and it happens the same. It has solutions over the periodic fields on over the reals, but no solutions over Q. So this is a very stepping stone in the way because we actually don't really have idea how to solve this uh, equations in general. And I'm talking only of degree three, okay? Um, so the problem begins very early. So geometrically speaking, um, here the, uh, there uh, lives um, genus one curves and genus zero curves, because I didn't say this before, but the genus uh, is kind of a better invariant it's, it's actually a topological invariant, and it's better for classifying um, the, all these because it not only depends on the degree, but it also depends on the singularities that one curve might have. So it's actually a better invariant for classifying all these. But for example, genus one curves here, this is very interesting because they can have infinitely many rational points, finally many, or no at all. Uh, we saw before that uh, so far we had either no uh, solutions or infinitely many, but we didn't saw so far that this equation ha can have inf uh, finally many. So this is the first time that we see this. So this uh, is K, K okay? Oh, and also didn't say this, but uh, rational points only mean uh, rational solutions of these equations. Okay, it's, but it's just um, the geometric way of saying this. This would be the algebraic way. It's speaking about solutions of polynomial equation could be the algebraic way of saying this. And the geometric point of view uh, or the geometric way would be saying um, the, the, the talking about the rational points of curves. Okay just for clarifying. So for example, like I said, uh, here we have a genus one curves and genus zero. This uh, would be a genus one curve because it's smooth, it, it doesn't have any singularities, but uh, these two curves are a uh, genus zero curves. This is what we call a cast because here it has a singularity, so it lo lowers the, um, the genus and this could be a node and this also has a singularity here in in the in the in the at the point zero so the, actually this these two uh, are the only uh, kind of singularities that we can have in this case the other ones when when we don't have singularities are like kind of like this or or like, or like the other uh, type of elliptic curve that I put at the beginning. Uh, okay, so um, now that we are starting, we see now that we are starting to have problems because we here we already fail. We, we don't know how this behaves. We, we say, okay, so if we go up, if we, now we see degree four, degree, degree five, degree six, it, it will get worse. And it's true. Obviously, we cannot like like uh, these mathematicians I said at the beginning. They prove that we cannot even have an algorithm for determines for determining if uh, uh, a random and uh, different equation has integer solutions. Uh, it's very difficult, and we don't know a lot. But there's a very important theorem that gives you a very uh, key information that. For degree greater than three, or if you want to talk about the genus, for genus greater than one, the uh, set of rational points is finite. We don't have infinitely many solutions anymore. We only have a finite number of them. In particular, we can have uh, no solutions at all, but we cannot have infinitely many. This is very strong result. This is Fulton's theorem, by the way, it's a very important theorem. So let's see what we have seen so far. So depending on the genus, we have seen that for genus zero, 
we have either infinitely many solutions or none at all. For genus greater than one, we have a finite, a finite, finitely many solutions or none at all. But for genus one, look, we have the three possibilities and it's the only case uh, where we have the, the three possibilities. We can have finite, infinite or none at all. So this case uh, stands out, right? So this is what this is uh, what will be our motivation for defining elliptic curves. This is why they deserve a name. So now I can explain you what an elliptic curve is properly, okay? So we say that an elliptic curve E defined over a field K, but actually during this uh, talk, we usually will be talking about uh, Q, about the rational uh, numbers. So an elliptic curve is an algebraic curve. So with this, I mean, I mean um, algebraic uh, variety of dimension one, okay? And it must satisfy some, some conditions. The first one is that is, it must be a smooth. So in the case, of uh, degree three, we want to avoid nodes and gasps. We want to um, focus on, on genus one curves. This uh, also, uh, this is important. This means that, um, so the elliptic curve must, must, be, must be projected. It means that uh, it must live in the projective plane but um, we will usually work um, or with affine charts, but we must remember that it actually lives in the projective plane because it will be important for something I will say later. Uh, like we said, uh, it, it has you know, one because it's a smooth, actually these conditions are pretty much related because in the case of the degree three, uh, being genus one implies being smooth, okay? So this is uh, this condition is exactly for all that we've been discussing, and this might be the well a well condition that it um, the elliptic curve must have a mark point called O. This will be actually the origin, and there's a very good reason for asking for this condition that I will explain uh, in a second. Okay. Uh, so, okay, so now, okay, um, that we that we have defined properly what an elliptic curve is, now we have another way of seeing them. We can see them as torus, at least when we have a elliptic curve over the complex numbers, they are isomorphic to a torus because the torus are genus one surfaces, right? And exactly, uh, or elliptic curves over algebraically closed fields are genus one curves. So we can think of elliptic curves as torus. This is another interesting way of seeing this. Seeing this. And there's actually a very beautiful isomorphism, but I won't cover this uh, in this talk. Maybe other time, who knows? Uh, also, um, there's also a lot of uh, good news from now uh, um, we will have, even though we don't know how elliptic curves behave very well, because the degree three already was was a problem for us. But we have very good news, um, despite of that. You see, um, we can write uh, elliptic curves in the so-called where it's transformed. So if you remember, in the degree three ca case, uh, it had a big um, polynomial equation. And this is much, much shorter than that, right? Um, the way of obtaining this um, virus transform, this model for elliptic curves that you can have for any elliptic curve um, is, of, is an application of the riemann rock theorem. And it's very beautiful how you obtain this a way of writing elliptic curves because because it's it's not only a change of variables it's actually a deep uh, theory uh, related using uh, the Riemann-Roch theorem. Okay, so um, turns out 
that we can do even better, but with a uh, we have, must be a bit careful because this model works for every elliptic curve over, I mean, of defined over every any field. But um, this for this model that is super short, we must be careful because it doesn't work for every field. We can't have this model for uh, fields of characteristic two or three. Okay, but hey, there's a lot of fields that doesn't have characteristic two or three. So uh, this is a very good way of writing elliptic curves because now if you if you see, it only depends on two numbers. You uh, give me now two numbers. Uh, you must be a bit careful that it doesn't gel a singular curve. But with that, a consideration you can give me two numbers and they can give you an elliptic curve this is this is amazing right this is a very short way of uh, this all actually is called a short by form and so we we can think uh, of elliptic curves like this so now that we have defined elliptic curves our goal is understanding rational points on elliptic curve because don't forget where we are coming from we are coming from wanting to understand the solutions of the Ophantine equations. This, uh, like I said before, uh, translates, translates into geometry as saying that we want to understand how are the rational points on elliptic curves. So this uh, will be our goal. Um, like I said, for, for example, let me give you, give you an example. This is an elliptic curve, the, is this elliptic curve. Um, this is interesting because this elliptic curve has only three rational points. This, these three rational points, it doesn't have more, even though this elliptic curve is infinite, okay? But it only has these three solutions. I don't know, I think this is very interesting. This is, might be pretty shocking if it's the first time that you see this, but it can happen, okay? So, oops, sorry, this is Spanish. This would be um, group law. This, uh, this is what it means. So, uh, this is a bit of a spoiler because it turns out that um, elliptic curves have a very, one of the most amazing, amazing things that they enjoy is that the rational points on elliptic curves enjoy um, a group structure, but not only group structure, but an abelian group structure. So for if, let me give you a very quick reminder of, of what a um, abelian group is. So it's a um, pair, like uh, you have a set um, and an operation, and it must satisfy uh, four things for being abelian, okay? So it must satisfy that uh, the associativity, it must satisfy that um, the, there must be a neutral element, uh, there must, oh, um, following condition is oops, that there must be an inverse element for every, every element of, of, on this set, there must be also its inverse, okay? And for being abelian, it must satisfy a commutativity. Commutativity, okay? So um, we have the set, the set is the rational points, and we need to come up with a way of summing, adding points on this elliptic curve. So I'm going to explain how to do this um, with without a lot of details, okay? So um, this is the geometric way of seeing this. Um, I'm going to take uh, two points. I'm going to, to suppose that they are rational points because otherwise it doesn't make sense. This could be P, this could be Q. Assume that they are rational points. And um, how do we, how can we uh, add these points? So what we do is we um, 
we draw the line that passes through them and it will cut, cut the curve in another point here. This will be uh, the point R. And this is not yet uh, the, the sum of P and Q. We must do one more step that is reflecting um, through the X axis, uh, more or less, okay? Um, and it will cut the curve here. And this is the, um, the sum. So doing this, you can actually write the algebraic equations for this. And uh, you can check that this operation is, um, is it has an abelian group structure. And this is very interesting because associativity is usually very easy to prove in general, but here it's very difficult to prove associativity in, a, in, a, in an elementary way. Uh, but a commutativity that is not a something um, mandatory for having a group structure, but for being a, an abelian group, it's mandatory. Uh, it's easy to see because it doesn't matter if you first sum P with Q or Q with P, it or in the end will yell the same point. So uh, it's kind of uh, funny no, that this happens. And uh, here it shows the importance of the condition that we were asking for elliptic curves of having these mark points. You remember this, this uh, point that we denote by a calligraphic O? Uh, this is related to the last step that we did here. Because uh, in projective geometry, uh, reflecting against the x-axis um, corresponds actually to pass, um, in this case, this point through the point of infinity. So you imagine a very far away point um, that passes through R, you would actually get a vertical line, right? So what we are doing is that we are not reflecting, we are passing R through the O point that would be so far away. And it turns out that, that this point on infinity uh, is a rational point we are considering as a condition, and it acts as the neutral element of the group law. That's, that's why it's important because um, for having a group, we need at least uh, a neutral element, okay? The empty group doesn't exist. So that's why it's important to consider the point and infinity a rational point, okay? So this is very cool because um, we have a nice structure uh, for, for, the, for the rational points. Um, and this will get us closer to understand that. But actually, uh, there's a super duper good news um, that is that it not only has an abelian group structure, but uh, the model type theorem, that it's one of the most important theorems in the theory of elliptic curves, says that this uh, group, um, this abelian group, is a finally generated abelian group. This is not trivial at all. This is a, this is a super important theorem that th this is always a finally generated abelian group. And there's some that in algebra we have a um, theorem that is an a structure theory for a, a structure theorem for finally generated abelian groups. Uh, this structure theorem in this case would apply like this. These are the rational points on elliptic curves, and applying this structure theorem with the model by theorem would gives give us this decomposition in the torsion group that this is a finite group. This would be the group where the, um, the points of finite order live. And this could be the um, what we call a the free uh, group. Um, and this is where the points of infinite order live. So in other, in other words, this could be where the linear, uh, linearly independent points 
uh, could live. Okay, and this this um, exponent here is a is a natural number. Um, it can be zero <laughs> because zero is natural, <laughs> um, and this is what we call the rank. Okay, so the, this is a uh, very important. This would be the number of linearly independent points in our in our elliptic curve. Okay. So let's think for a moment the progress that we made because uh, now we have um, we have we have another we can take another approach to understand the rational points since we always have this, this decomposition we can uh, try to understand the rational points studying this part and studying this part I, if we if we understand both parts we could completely understand uh, how how the rational points in general works. So let's start. What do we know about the torsion part, uh, the, the, the finite, uh, the points of finite order? So the, I love this because uh, this is one of my favorite theorems uh, in the in the theory of elliptic curve, or in general, actually. This is uh, the Mathers theorem. And it says that over Q, if you have an elliptic curve over Q, the torsion group, this torsion group can be isomorphic only to one of the following 15 groups. Set mode N for N equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 12, not 11. 11 is not here. And this is very cool, OK? Uh, and a uh, set mode two uh, times set a mode n for n equals two, four, six, and eight. I mean, this is crazy, right? Because it gives us exactly all the possibilities for the torsion part. And also what's the deal with the 11? Why it's not there, right? Uh, this observation is, is uh, related to the theory of modular curves, and it's it's a very big part of the proof of Maser's theorem. Um, it's it's it develop a very uh, heavy theor theory for for studying uh, torsion points. So it's it, this observation is actually very very interesting. Oh, um, other thing, uh, all these possibilities happen. We have examples of, of, of elliptic curves that have all these uh, torsion groups. And um, turns out that we actually can parameterize um, elliptic curves uh, with a given uh, torsion group. So this is um, a very this is a, a very heavy step. This is very important that we have this classification. I think this is crazy. So if we understand so well um, how the torsion group behaves, obviously the problem would be in this part, in the rank or the free part, because we don't know a lot of the about the rank. And there's a conjecture that there exist elliptic curves over Q with arbitrary large rank. But turns out that the record is uh, this curve that Noam Elkins, Elkins found in uh, 2006, this elliptic, elliptic curve here, um, which has rank at least uh, 28, which is not a super large number. So there's a bit of um, polemic with this because some people think that the, um, la the rank is bounded for elliptic curves and some people think that the, it can be arbitrarily large. So um, we don't know a lot about this. Oh, um, okay, so this is very sad because a lot of uh, problems in mathematics depend on on the rank of elliptic curves. So 
let me give, present you uh, one of my favorite problems in mathematics that is called the congruent number problem. And it's related to, to this um, lack of knowledge that we have out there about the rank. So first, uh, let me tell you what, um, what a congruent number is. We say that an integer, a uh, positive integer, is a congruent number if it's the area of a right triangle whose size are rational numbers. Um, so I will give you an example in a moment, but the problem, or at least the modern way of stating it, because it uh, was born uh, 1,000 years ago, uh, in a very different, it's very different formulation, and the history is very cool. Eh? I encourage you to to search for it because it's it's very cool. Uh, but the modern way of of stating this problem is: Can we find an algorithm that determines if a number is congruent or not? So, for example, um, six could be a congruent number because it's the area of this right triangle whose sides are rational. In fact, they are integers. Uh, we can ask, ask for more. We, 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 we not only have rational, but we have integer sides. So for example, six could be a congruent number. Let me give you a, a more difficult uh, example. Uh, 157 is congruent because it's the area of this triangle whose now uh, the sides are rational uh, properly. Um, uh, surprisingly, this is the easiest uh, triangle that we can find for, for this number uh, to be congruent. So, so yeah, uh, we can have maybe difficult triangles, but it's congruent in the end. So how is this problem about triangles related to elliptic curves? Um, let's think a bit about this problem, but I don't really want you to care about a lot about what I'm, what's written, okay? But uh, let's think about, a bit. Uh, we denote A, B, and C, the, the rational size of, of, our, of our right triangle, okay? And we denote by n the, the our, our congruent number. We are supposing it's congruent. So it must ver verify these two equations. This is because of the Pythagoras, Pythagoras theorem. And this could be the condition of the n being congruent because it must be the area of, of, of this triangle. So, this uh, takes work, okay, but uh, let me say at least that if we set these quantities x and y like this that depends on, on these numbers, um, we can write this equation here. These quantities x and y satisfy this equation. Um, doesn't this look familiar? Because this pretty much looks like an elliptic curve, right? Um, and in fact, it's a short by Strauss form elliptic curve. Um, so, so yeah, we we somehow have obtained a, an elliptic curve from from this. And conversely, we can set um, a, b, and c uh, these quantities depending on on now x and y. And we can check that they verify these uh, conditions. Okay, I don't really want you to care a lot about this because I'm reading all this just to give you an isomorphism of the Pythagoras, Pythagorean triples. This means triangles and rational points on, of this party. Oops, uh, of this particular kind of elliptic curves. Okay, so somehow we have found an isomorphism between triangles and rational points on this elliptic curve. This means in the end that these two objects, this is the, the 150-57 uh, triangle, um, and this object is very, very 
uh, super related because what we are saying is that for every um, solution that we find here in this elliptic curve, this could be this elliptic curve in this case, um, you using this equation, you would get this uh, elliptic, this is elliptic curve, okay? So for every solution that we find here, or every rational point, we can get a triangle that uh, in, that has rational size and area uh, 157. So I think this is uh, very magical, right? Because why should the triangles and elliptic curves be, be connected at, in the first place? But it turns out that that is this happens. And if you continue studying the, the, this congruent number problem, you will see that um, you can get a char characterization that says that if this elliptic curve has a positive rank, then this n a number is congruent. And this is the problem that is a characterization is an if and only if, but we don't know anything about the rank. So this problem is unsolved yet, and it has uh, 1,000 years. Uh, actually, let me just say a cool thing that this could be completely solved if the, by, a, the, by, by this theorem of tunnel, I'm not going to read it, but it would be solved by, by, by this um, theorem. But the converse depend on a, the PSD conjecture. And this is a conjecture about the rank of elliptic curves. So um, th that's a very big problem. Now, what's this BSD conjecture that is also related to the rank? This is um, one of the main uh, conjectures, not only in the theory of elliptic curves, but in mathematics, because it's one of the millennium uh, problems. So you solve this, you can get uh, $1 million. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, research on this. And the Virchow cementor diagram conjecture um, says that if we consider an elliptic curve over Q, and we consider also its L function, whatever that means, uh, now we can think about a function that is attached uh, to, to the elliptic curve. I will explain in a moment what, is, what this means, but let's think that it's some kind of function that depends on, on, on the elliptic curve. So what it says is that uh, this um, L function has a zero at the point S equals one. And the order of vanishing at that point is exactly the algebraic rank of the elliptic curve. So it's telling us exactly what's the rank uh, of the elliptic curve. And also, please don't get too scared um, because it gives, uh, gives us more. It gives us the, reci the, the residue uh, at the point S equals 1. Um, don't get, I know this is, looks very scary, but um, but those uh, per, um, terms that appear here are only invariants of the curve. So we would, if we solve this conjecture, we would know how to get also the residue at S equals one. And we will know exactly what's the rank of elliptic curves over Q, but this is a conjecture still. So, Maybe this doesn't make a lot of sense if you don't know what, at, what an L function. So I'm going to explain you what's an L function. But first, for understanding what was an L function, I need to talk to you about a very cool thing that are elliptic curves over finite fields, but not over every finite field, only um, finite fields of this form, okay? If you want, if you don't know what a finite field is, you can think of this right now, set um, modulo p, okay? Because this is all that we care about so far here. And 
um, because I've been all the time basically talking about elliptic curves over Q over the rationals, but I don't have a reason for doing this. I mean, I can talk about elliptic curves over other different things. So let me keep explain this with an example. Let's consider this elliptic curve that is given in virus transform, not, not sure, but virus transform. So what, what happens if we want to consider this elliptic curve not over Q anymore, but over a finite field uh, of P elements, where P is a prime number? So there's a bit of a problem of a problem because in this example, um, for, for P equals 2, 3, and 31, the elliptic curve is no longer an elliptic curve. This means that it has singularities. If we consider this equation over um, set mode 2, set mode 3, and set mode C, uh, 31. Uh, so if you remember, there are only two types of singularity. Um, and I choose this example on purpose because this elliptic curve has uh, all the, the three uh, types of singularity. So for example, at P equals two, we say that it has bad additive reduction. This means that when we mode this elliptic curve, um, we do this mode two, we would get a cusp. If you remember, it, it was something like this uh, with a singularity here, okay? So this is what we call about the reduction. When we, when we do the reduction, we get a cusp. And now in P um, equals three and 31, we, when we do the reduction uh, over these primes, we get a node, so something like this. But there are two types. Uh, of multiplicative, this is what we call multiplicative reduction, and there are two cases. Uh, so let me write this a bit bigger. So when, if you uh, see the node, we can draw the uh, tangent lines uh, in the singularity. I mean, it should be better than this, but uh, you can imagine the, the tangent lines over this, the, this theorem, it turns out that if the slopes of these tangent lines are in the field where we uh, have done the reduction, then we say we say that the reduction is multiplicate is split multiplicative. So in the case of three, the the slopes of these tangent lines are in, in set over set three. But in the case of 31, the slopes are not of these tangent lines are not in in the in in the in this field. So we distinguish distinguish these two these two cases of multiplicative reduction, but it's basically when um, they transform in, in nodes, okay? Oh, also let me mention that, uh, well, uh, in the rest of primes, uh, the, the reduction is good. So if we do the reduction for all the other primes, we get also an elliptic curve. And um, let me just say something that I will uh, remember later as well, but when we have good, oops, when we have Good, good reduction and multiplicative reduction for every prime, uh, we say that our elliptic curve is semi-stable. Okay? I will remember this later because it's important. But it's only when it's, it has good reduction and multiplicative reduction for every prime. Okay? Um, okay? So, so, okay, so in this example, we, we begin with, with this elliptic curve that's over Q. And now let me show you how this elliptic curve uh, looks like in, in a finite field. This is a curve, it's an elliptic curve. Uh, it doesn't look like that anymore, but over this finite field, this means, means set over set um, 67, this elliptic curve looks like this. Uh, 
so our finite fields they they look so different and they are still uh curves so i think there we have another a uh, different way of of perceiving elliptic curves when we do the reduction over or primes okay uh so why i'm telling you all this because now i can uh, talk about L functions, the, fu the function that appears in the Birchian Dwarf conjecture. Um, we, the easiest way of thinking about L functions is think about them as generalizations of the Riemann zeta function. So if you don't know a lot about uh, the Riemann zeta function, um, uh, it's given by, by an infinite sum, it's, it's a complex function. Uh, given by this infinite sum, and um, it has very nice properties. For example, um, one of the properties that that this uh, Riemann zeta function enjoys is that it has something that we call an Euler product. That is this expression here. So an Euler product would be an infinite product that runs runs over all primes. Okay, so instead of writing this uh, Riemann zeta function as an infinite sum, we can write it as an uh, infinite product of, of prime numbers. And if you know a bit about the Riemann hypothesis, um, it conjecturally, conjecturally gives us um, distribution of uh, primes. And, and you know, it's a very important conjecture that encodes a lot of arithmetic information about the prime numbers. So, this also is very similar for elliptic curves, for L functions of elliptic curves. Like I said, it's a generalization. So if you look at the L function of an elliptic curve over Q, um, you can see that the infinite sum, they, they are defined in a very similar way. It's just the difference that here we don't have a one anymore, but we have so coefficients are called the Fourier coefficients. And these uh, coefficients depend on a very interesting thing that is um, in this uh, reduction, how many points are there? Because it's not a, a trivial question. Uh, for every reduction, how many points are there? This is a very important um, question and, and a very, very interesting thing to study. So the, these four coefficients depend on, on how many points are uh, over every um, reduction. But the problem is that here in this infinite sum, it's not very clear to see this because the IN, um, this runs over every um, number or uh, over every natural number, but, um, but we could only understand the, the a sub p for, for prime. So we would have to define how it works for composite numbers and stuff we, that we can do. But I think it's more clear if we see this in the Euler product form that they also have. They don't, it, there's no reason for them to have an Euler product a priori, but they have an Euler product. And you can write this uh, Euler product as uh, this where this thing that appears in the denominator is a local factor that depends on the kind of reduction um, modulo p. And now this runs over every prime p. So now we can actually understand uh, better how this works. Um, I won't give you the explicit um, um, the explicit formula, but, but this is actually this, a local factor that depends on the on all these types that we've seen of reductions and also depends on the number of points that there are um, um, over every, um, in these cases, okay, over, for every P. So uh, turns out that these both functions um, also, like I said, they have very nice properties and what, um, in concretely, they have analytic continuation to the whole complex plane. 
the, this means that we can talk about uh, every point S of, uh, we can plug, plug here every uh, point of the complex plane. We, we can't do that a priori because we would need to talk about convergence and stuff, but turns out that, um, that we, we can uh, have analytic continuation to the complex plane. And they also satisfy a certain functional equation. So this is an expression that relates um, certain va values of, of the function. So for example, um, there, there exists um, a functional equation for, for the Riemann zeta function that relates um, this, these two, two values. Um, of the, the, the relates these these two values and similarly for 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 elliptic curves, uh, we have a functional equation. Sorry, that relates relates these two values. So so we have like uh, some kind of of um, of expression that that give give us a relation between special values. And this is also very important and it doesn't need to happen as well, but it actually happens. So it's important. Okay, so now that, um, let me go back for a moment because now that we have seen L functions in more depth, uh, we now can make more sense of the first statement because um, turns out that, that this, um, infinite sum, uh, this L function has, a, we can check that it has a zero at S equals one. And um, it actually makes sense to talk about the point S equals one because it has analytic continuation, okay? That now we can make sense of this. And that what it's saying is that um, the algebraic rank must match um the order of vanishing of this um of this um l function at the point s equals one so it's kind of relating analytic objects with algebraic objects very directly can, like that's a very crazy thing and it's solving a very important uh, problem in in all this theory of elliptic curves if, if we manage to to prove it Okay, so now with all that we have talked, uh, we, can, we can actually talk now a bit about the Fermat-Lass theorem because I think this is a very um, curious thing that, that people, uh, it's always very interesting, but it's a very complicated thing. I, I, I have, I mean, I, I never read the paper of Fermat-Lass theorem. I just uh, have an idea of the proof because it's what I learned in the books, but um, I'm not an expert at all. Uh, so I want to give you, I want to, you to, to explain a bit of how it was done. Uh, so let me give you a reminder. Um, Fermat's theorem says that, that this equation has no e integers trivia, uh, has no integer solutions, at least uh, non trivia solutions for n a uh, greater or equal than three. Uh, this is very, very famous. This is one of the most famous uh, theorems that it's been up uh, these last years. Uh, again, we asked uh, what, what uh, so let me say that uh, Fermat uh, was born, uh, live like through, through these years, more or less, more or less, okay? I'm not very sure, but more or less he lived through these years. So in some year of his life, uh, he had to write his famous quote, uh, quote uh, saying that he found a marvelous proof of, of this theorem, but the margin was too short for, for, for it to contain. And he never proved it, he died and, and he never proved it. So we, we can ask now what, what's been the progress um, uh, from these uh, years. So Euler 
prove the case for n equals three in in this year. Um, oh, Fermat proved himself some case, a, a very important case that is the case n equals four, and it's the, it's one of the most important cases. And it's all the proof is also very related to the congruent number problem, by the way. It's, it's a very magical thing. At least he proved uh, the case n equals four. Then in uh, 1825, uh, uh, the and Legendre proved the case for n equals five. And uh, a bit later, Lame, uh, Gabriel Lame, prove the case for n equals seven. So what's, why is not six here? Um, okay, let's note a thing. And is that uh, the theorem, uh, we, we only need to prove it for primes. Great, well, now we're greater than seven because all these cases were proven. Uh, and why is that? Because let's uh, consider that n is a prime, uh, uh, times some other number uh, without loss of generality, okay? Uh, so we can write uh, this equation um, like this. Um, to the P, to the P. Okay, so if we prove that for every prime, um, there's no solution, then there, there, there also won't be a solution for this. We, we, if you want, we can uh, set uh, new variables, uh, u equal a, a, x to the a, um, v equals e to the a, and set, um, uh, sorry, um, t equals set to the a. So uh, there, there also won't be, um, if we prove that for P there, there are no solutions, that, that there won't be also solutions for, for these uh, cases, okay? So it's uh, enough to prove for primes. Um, and and in, since all this was proven uh, for primes greater than seven. So how was it done? Um, this, uh, starts more or less in uh, 100, uh, 1984, when the mathematician Frey obtained an elliptic curve, assuming that there exists a solution to this, uh, now that, now that uh, we can think of this equation for primes, he assumed that there exists a solution, ABC, and in a very difficult way, he obtained an elliptic curve that is called the Frey curve, is this elliptic curve here. And um, so, it, I mean, it's difficult to obtain this curve, but if you want, we naively can think that in the congruent number problem, we, we did some uh, similar thing, but it's, it's a much more easy to easier to do in the congruent number problem case than here okay but in the pro, in the congruent number problem we started with some equations and we obtain an elliptic curve so we naively can think that something similar happened here um so he obtained this elliptic curve and he proved some properties of this curve uh, in particular, he proved that this curve is semi-stable for every p, and for 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 this uh, solution. Um, so, if you remember, semi-stable means that uh, the reduction of at every prime is a um, good reduction or multiplicative reduction. Okay, we saw this in the reduction part. So he proved that, okay? And two years uh, later, Sir and Rivet proved uh, that if such a curve exists, it cannot be modular, whatever that means. Uh, if, that, if this curve exists, then um, it cannot satisfy some condition. 
I will explain later what modular means because it's very interesting. Um, but but they prove this, and this is also very difficult to prove. Um, it's not trivial at all um, to prove this, but they managed to prove this two years later. And then uh, finally, in 1995, Wiles and Taylor proved the following. Every semi-stable elliptic curve defined over the rational is modular. So Fermat's theorem uh, is proof because we reach a contradiction. We suppose that there's a solution. We obtain a, an elliptic curve that must be semi-stable and is not modular. But that cannot happen because uh, every um, semi-stable elliptic curve defined over Q is modular. So Fermat's theorem is proof. So this is a very um, general idea, but, the, but all those, these uh, parts are, in fact, very difficult to prove, and it takes a lot of work. And um, OK, so let me explain um, what this modular thing, because this seems to be key um, um, for proving Fermat's theorem, right? If, if we hadn't had then this condition, uh, we weren't able to prove this. So let me explain what modular means. But And for this, I need to talk about some objects that seems, seem to be totally unrelated to the elliptic curves, because these objects that I'm going to talk about are called modular forms. And they are um, some kind of analytic objects that uh, they seem to have no relation a priori. Le let's begin, OK? Um, we take a complex number that lives in the upper half plane. Uh, we are now talking about the complex. So uh, we, uh, if this is the, y, the i and this is the real part, we are talking about all these, uh, the upper half plane. So we take a number, a complex number that lives here. And a modular form, f of weight k, is a, com a complex function that goes from this uh, upper half plane to the complex number satisfying three conditions. The first condition is that f must be an holomorphic function. Um, so in this, um, so we, if you do you know a lot of uh, complex analysis, you can kind of think that it's an, a smooth function uh, that doesn't have singularities, um, OK? It doesn't have poles either. Um, but yeah, you, you, if you want, you can think of a smooth function in some weird sense. Um, F of set, uh, stay, well, the absolute value stays bounded as the imaginary part of set goes to infinity. OK, this is another condition. And now it, it comes the most difficult condition, I'd say, but Let's try to understand this. This is called also the modularity condition. And it's, it says that the, the modular form must satisfy this, this equation from, for, from here. And you might wonder what are uh, those numbers. So this is um, related to, to um, a group called SL2C. This is uh, called also modular group. And this consists um, on the matrices um, two by two, which, which A, B, C are integers, and such that the determinant is one. Um, a, B, C, D are integers. OK, so this is what we call the modular group. And the result that this modular group um, acts uh, on the upper half plane. And uh, obviously, it acts by, by, by this, this matrix in the, in the geometric way. So the, the, this um, expression that is inside here is what we call a Mobius transformation. I uh, will leave, leave you a video in the description of, in the description of how to be, visualize 
uh, Mobius transformation to have yes an intuitive um, uh, thinking of it, but uh, it turns out that that the, it acts it acts in in the upper half plane, and we can define um, um, an equivalence relation up to this kind of matrices. So we can can identify points um, if they they differ by a matrix of this group of this modular group so what we are saying here um, is that um, when we when uh, when we have a mobius transformation we apply a modular form to it uh, it must uh, be the 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 f of set itself and some well term it's like an error term kind of but really what it's saying here in this um condition is that there are lots and lots and lots of symmetries and um, i know this doesn't can make a lot of sense because it's very abstract but now it will give you a more uh, an easiest way of uh, seeing this um also if, the, if this limit here is not only space bounded, but it's zero, we say that F is a cusp form and this um, will be the, the interesting one in, in our case. Uh, also on the weight K appears here and uh, that I also will give you an intuitive way of thinking about it later. So um, you see the SL2C group, the modular group, uh, you can prove that that is generated by two matrices that are um wait let me let me try to yes it's by it's generated by this matrix and by um this matrix you can prove it okay but that this the cell to c group is generated by these two matrices so that would be equivalent to plug these two matrices here and we would get two conditions that are these these the two these two conditions and you can see now that um these conditions are kind of easier uh to think about them because here we don't even have the weight uh, we we have only a periodicity relation we we are saying that uh, the modular form is periodic with period one and you can see this in the picture because this is what happens here we we have a uh, period uh, one uh, it's periodic with period one and the other um condition is looks it's a bit more difficult but it would correspond to to the rest of um of symmetries that you can see here and it this depends on on the weight um that uh, i will talk about the about this in a moment so like i said that there are lots of symmetries in the end so let me give you examples of modular forms the, the easiest one are the einstein series uh, you can write an equation uh for for them uh, explicitly, but let me give, show you the pictures. Um, so if we uh, restrict to, to the fundamental domain, if you want, here, this is an existing series of weight for, and how to interpret the weight um, is, um, you can see that here, it, there are two leaves, uh, one here and one here. So the weight here is four. And we have two leaps that is exactly half of the weight. Uh, similarly, uh, here we have an existing series of weight eight. And you can see, oops, you can see that if we restrict to a, a fundamental domain here, we have four leaps, one here, 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 and here. Also the, the half. So in the end, the weight is also related to these uh, other symmetries um here okay it's more deep than that but i just want you to kind of think intuitively of this well so um because of this 
uh, condition here, we can talk about the Taylor expansions. Um, if we set a uh, Q to be this quantity here, uh, we can write uh, cast forms um, uh, in, in a, as a Taylor expansion, thanks to the periodicity condition. Um, so we can write them just like this uh, to some coefficients um and q to the m an infinite sum of this if for modular forms in general not cast forms we would have another term here uh, a sub c uh, a not uh but in but uh for cast forms we we don't have this term. and um we can also talk about the l functions of of this um cast forms and modular forms uh, which is very, very, very similar of what we've been doing uh, with the other uh, L functions. Uh, we define them as the AM over N to the S. And what are, is, are those AN? As this AN are exactly these coefficients of the Taylor expansion. So, um, and also, it turns out that under certain conditions, uh, we can have Euler product, analytic continuation to the complex plane, and a functional equation for cast forms of even uh, weight uh, that I'm not writing explicitly, but this actually happens, can happen under certain technical conditions. So now you can, I think you can get an idea. Uh, we've been talking about L functions on elliptic curves. We just talked about the L functions of modular forms. What would be a modular elliptic curve? So an, an elliptic curve defined over Q is modular if there exists a modular form whose L function Match, matches the L function of the elliptic curve. This is crazy because um, we, in Fermat's theorem, what we are proving is that for semi-stable elliptic curves, this happens. It, it happens that there is this weird analytic object um, with, which which has lots, lots of restrictions of symmetries of the, it seems to be so unrelated to elliptic curves, but, but there exists one whose L function is exactly the same that an elliptic and a semi-stable elliptic curve over Q. Uh, this uh, for me is absolutely crazy um, because that's, that happens in some cases even. But turns out that in 2001, the modularity theorem, also uh, historically known as the Yamashimura Bale conjecture, was proven. And it says that every elliptic curve defined over Q is modular. So this means that every, not only semi stable, but every elliptic curve over Q, uh, uh, for every, uh, such curve, there exists this modular form, a modular form that that has the same L function that the, the elliptic curve. And we can say even more. We can say that, in fact, um, the modular form that exists is a cast form of weight two. They, they, they all, all, every elliptic curve defined over Q is related to a cast form of way two. It's crazy that this relation holds, but it holds. So let me give you an example to, to see how this works. Um, so for example, um, if you take uh, this elliptic curve here, um, this gas form of way two here, uh, now written this the, in Taylor expansion, they have the same L function that is this one. Uh, and also one thing that is very cool is that now um, 
it's very easy to obtain L functions uh, from from gas forms because they correspond exactly to to the coefficients of the Taylor expansion. So if you see here, um, this one is the one here. The minus one is is here. My, my minus two is this minus two, one one, so and so on. So, but for ellipticals, it's more difficult because it depends on prime numbers, um, on every reduction, um, over every uh, prime number, and that's more difficult. But for for gas forms, is is easier. Um, so I don't know. I think that this is crazy because this is saying that these two objects are directly related uh, elliptic curves that are algebra geometric objects are completely related to um, these well analytic objects with lots of symmetries and uh, restrictions so i don't know i think this this is fascinating and um, what's it's more fascinating is that um, this proof of Fermat's theorem um, was the the opened the door to to a, a lot of conjectures that's called the Lang Langs program. Um, it's related to the Lang Langs program that set a lot of conjectures that not that this must happen always. Um, this is like very quickly said, uh, but. Uh, we, because it's proven for elliptic curves over Q, but what's what the Langlands program want to prove is that this must happen for um, for for elliptic curves over um, over number fields, so extensions of Q, and also not only for elliptic curves, but for a generalization of elliptic curves. Um, they are called abelian varieties and they are some kind of um, higher dimension elliptic curves. So they are higher dimensional objects, geometric objects that that also have this nice uh, abelian group structure. And they say the the the, the conjectures uh, kind of say that that they are related to certain automorphic forms that are also generalization of modular forms. So now we kind of understand a bit uh, this, the diagram of the lang langs program that um, elliptic curves lives, live here in the motivic world. So we have talked about the L functions of elliptic curve, how to obtain them. We also talk about the L functions of modular forms that live here in the automorphic world. And this uh, line here is uh, the bridge that the modularity theorem uh, gives give us the the this bridge that them there must exist, exist an L function that 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 is shared by by the elliptic curves and some modular forms. Uh, we can see this through L functions. That is what we've been talking about. But there's also a very um, a very interesting way of studying this that is actually I think that there's even more research on the in this using this point of view that is with Galois representations so it's very it's similar in the sense that uh, what says is that um, if you obtain a Galois representation of, of elliptic curve um, this Galois representation must match to a Galois representation of some modular form and same for a billion varieties uh, automorphic forms these uh, are very uh, like very quickly said uh, the conjectures and there are even more they are it goes deeper but um this is the the idea that all these words the automorphic world and the motivic world are connected and we can see this through l functions um and Galois representations so so th this is i find this amazing because it, it relates lots of areas of mathematics and and give us a uh, very deep and and really uh, they are no no i think 
no one really knows why this happens. Why, why should there, this connection exist, right? Uh, I don't know. I, I think it's very interesting because it's very mysterious, um, I think. So, so that's it. Um, uh, th I finish uh, this talk. Uh, I, I hope uh, that you have learned something and that you enjoy this. Um, and these are the references that I have used. Um, th this is mainly the, the book I have used from Alvaro Lozano Robledo. Um, I basically learned most of the things I know about the elliptical from, from this book. Uh, and this book um, also that I'm studying is uh, the Bible of Elliptic Curves, uh, the Arithmetic of Elliptic Curves by Silverman. Um, uh, here is every, bas the, basically everything um, you want to know about the elliptic curves. Um, also, this is a very cute book um, because it, it gives us a very entry level of, of all this story and talks about elliptic curves, L functions. Um, so it's a very accessible book um, and easy to understand. And this uh, also talks, this book is very cool as well because it, it talks a lot about the congruent number problem. Um, and about modular forms, all these connections as well is uh, this is great also for beginning to um, to learn this. Oh, also, this uh, is my favorite uh, that database that, uh, that there are lots of information on this uh, database um, that you can access uh, in the internet, um, and you you can get lots of example of elliptic curves and their their modular forms. Um, I don't know, there's a lot of information um, about elliptic curves here as well, and modular forms and everything we, we have to talk. And more. <laughs> and, okay, uh, finally, uh, thanks also to, to my cat, Sally, because I read the Silverman book with her. Uh, and, well, and thank you all of you for, for seeing this. Um, I really hope that you have enjoyed this and you can learn something about all this talk and i hope also that you um that i have encouraged you to uh learn about elliptic curves and modular forms and uh, study these these relations that that looks so interesting at least for me uh well okay so thank you so much again and goodbye <laughs>